it's my pleasure to uh, interview Michael and um, welcome him to Santa Cruz. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. It's very good to be here. And I want to talk about Proposition 37. <laughs> and and um, what's at stake? Because I think it's, 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 it's bigger than California. It's yeah, bigger than I GMOs. I think it's a national issue. Yeah. Well, the two of us, and we were just comparing notes. This is the first time we've met. Um, but we've both been devoting a lot of time and energy to this particular ballot initiative. And um, I think it's a real moment of truth for the food movement, generally. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm, I don't know whether I would have picked to fight a big battle like this on this issue, um, but it's the one we have. And it is a, a very important opportunity to demonstrate that there are votes in reforming the food system. And uh, that's something that is not yet appreciated in Washington, uh, where this movement is, is not taken seriously. Um, and there is a lot happening. I mean, I think we are building a food movement, and I think we see it in these alternative, uh, this alternative food economy that's rising all around us. I mean, you're all part of it. Um, when you go to the farmer's market, when you join a CSA, um, and, uh, and so these very interesting structures are being created, and people are voting with their forks for a different kind of food system. Um, but voting with your votes is really different um, and, and commands uh, a certain respect uh, and uh, creates a certain fear in Washington. And, and big food, the food industry, agribusiness, understands what's at stake here. And that's why they're spending what? How much are they spending? A million dollars a day. A million dollars a day to defeat this thing. So they know what's at stake. And what's at stake is the fact that the public wants to have a say in how their food is produced, uh, wants to be able to choose to opt out of something like genetically modified food. And we can talk about the, you know, the issue of, you know, is there a problem with genetically modified food, but I think the big, the big issue and, and all I really care about is the right to know and transparency. Um, I don't think that the issue here is, is GM food dangerous. I haven't been, frankly, persuaded that it is. Um, I hasten to add that it hasn't been tested very carefully. Um, so I don't think we know that for sure. Um, but uh, I think there's no good reason to eat this stuff right now. Um, and that's why they're fighting so hard uh, to make it impossible for you to choose. Because there's no benefit to the consumer. I mean, if these crops offer anything to anybody, it's, it's a certain measure of convenience to farmers and an unprecedented amount of control to seed breeders. Um, but to consumers, they're no cheaper, they're no more delicious, they're no more nutritious. Um, all they offer is this unquantifiable potential risk. So if you do your risk-benefit analysis, as you should as a consumer, you would think, well, why would I eat this? The rational decision is, I think I'll wait and see what they, you know, what happens. Um, and, that's, and that's why this, you know, they don't want you to have this choice. So I didn't mean, to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to speechify, but I feel strongly about this. <laughs> well, we want to hear your, 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 your. Uh, I, I've thought about this, and I see their ads, and I see their propaganda, and uh, their efforts to control the food supply. I mean, Monsanto and a few others control about 50% of the seed supply right now. And, yeah, two and, companies, Monsanto and DuPont, yeah, I think it is. Yeah. yeah. If their goal was to, uh, reduce world hunger, as they will claim, there are certain properties that they would be seeking to engineer into the seeds that they are they're modifying. Enhanced nutrient profiles, ability to tolerate drought, uh, ability to grow on substandard soils, alkaline soils, acid soils, um, in, increased antioxidant properties. There's certain kinds of things you'd see. Ability to, to, to um, to, to thrive without expensive inputs. Mm -hmm. um, but so far, they're the opposite. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's, not what they're, that's not what they're giving us. And, and in fact, as a result of Roundup Ready crops, which is the primary 
one, we are seeing an avalanche of Roundup used, and to the point now that it's becoming, weeds are becoming resistant, um, and we're starting to see 2,4-D. Um, it seems to be a vicious circle, um, cycle that's taking us down a dark place. Well, it's the, old, it's the old pattern. In a way, there's nothing new about these crops, right? It's just the pesticide treadmill with a, with a couple new tricks. Right? I mean, you, 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 you engineer a trade into these crops so that it allows you to spray a lot of herbicide on them. And then when that herbicide fails, which it's failing, then you move to another more toxic one. Um, so the idea that this was going to be a different paradigm, as, as Monsanto promised, or more sustainable, uh, so far it hasn't been true. It's led to more pesticide use. Um, and I think you're right. I mean, I think that it, the, the mystery of the industry is that after, what, 18 years, that they haven't come up with anything better than Roundup and BT. Roundup is the, is the herbicide resistance. BT is, the, is uh, the, the plants that produce their own insecticide. And I did some reporting on Mon Monsanto. I wrote a piece about uh, genetic engineering in, in 1998 for the Times. And I, had this, I got this amazing access to Monsanto. Up to that point, I was a, a garden writer. And that's how I approached them. <laughs> and, and I said, you know, I'm a, I write about gardens for the New York Times, and I'd really, you know, I think this is the next wrinkle in our relationship to plants, and I'd love to grow some of your, your GMO crops. I've actually grown GM potatoes in my farm, so it's not, I guess it's not organic. Um, and, uh, and just to see what it's all about. And, you know, garden writers are the most benign people on the planet. <laughs> so... <laughs> Except so, one. Uh, so they let me in. And, and I had this amazing access. And I got to uh, meet every executive and all their scientists. And I went to the, I helped the woman who takes the freshly uh, genetically uh, inserted plants and you know, puts them in their little Petri dishes and takes them from there and puts them into soil. And, and, uh, and then I went to visit all their, the farms that are buying their stuff. And it was a wonderful experience. And, when they, but I said, so are you worried about resistance and BT and Roundup? And they said, oh, these are just the first generation. Within five years, here's what we're going to have. We're going to have plants that can fix their own nitrogen and drought tolerant and climate change resistant and, and <laughs> high yield and all this wonderful stuff and nutritionally enhanced. But for some reason, it hasn't come. <laughs> And no, but I think that that's telling. I think that there's actually some problem there. That if you think about what the understanding of genetics was in 1998, it's very different than it is today. And you go back to 98, and everybody thought that every gene uh, led to the expression of uh, the, the creation of a protein, which was a single trait. So you had this linear pro uh, process. Gene, protein, trait, one for one. And then, they, then we had the Human Genome Project. And something kind of amazing happened, which is we counted how many genes we have. And to our astonishment, there were only 25,000 genes. We expected to find hundreds of thousands of genes. And it was, it was like a scandal. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, we're such complicated characters. But we had fewer genes than, like, rice. And <laughs> way to go, rice. Um, I think we're like up there with the round worm. Uh, <laughs> so then people try to figure out how could you produce all this wondrous complexity, you know, the human brain consciousness, with 25,000 genes. And they began to realize, oh, it's not just the genes. It's, and, and also, it's not a, a linear one-to-one -one process. It's a very elaborately networked process. So one gene can actually make several different things happen depending on where it is and what uh, regulator genes, which in those days were called junk DNA, which was our arrogance. We didn't know what 95% of the genome did, so we said, ah, it's junk. <laughs> but it turns out to be very, very important. And then we learned about epigenetics, the fact that the environment does affect genes and, and leads to changes that can be inherited. That's, that's an astonishing idea. So my point is the whole technology may be based on a false understanding of how the genome works. And it may be that Monsanto at this moment is struggling with that and hasn't figured out how to do anything complicated and wonderful yet. They can just do these one gene uh, or two gene or three gene things. 
I don't know. I, I think we're going to learn that there's a, there's a problem at the very heart of the technology, and that's why they're stuck with these two products that essentially offer consumers nothing and, uh, except doubt. And, uh, you know, so that, I think that's how they find themselves vulnerable to labeling as a giant threat to their business model. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd be, you know, I mean, it's weird. They do brag about GM on the editorial pages yeah. in the op-ed, you know, uh, it's going to feed the world, as you were saying. It's going to, it's going to uh, solve climate change and double productivity of agriculture. So they're happy to talk to the elites about this, but they're not happy to talk to consumers. And I think the reason is that they don't have anything to, to offer the consumer. The ads, um, the, the no on 37 ads, um, um, describe the proposition as a uh, deceptive labeling scheme. They, they never mention the yeah, words genetically really engineered yeah. or the words genetically modified or Why biotech. Well, because I think they're trying to avoid the subject. Yeah. And they don't want to have a discussion about genetic engineering. No, That's they right. don't. And they don't want people to even think about it. And I, it seems to me that what they're trying to do is to control what we are allowed to be aware of. It's actually a c compression of consciousness. It's, it's, a, it's a war on awareness. It's, you're not, it's like eat in the dark, eat what you're told, and shut up. Yeah. Don't think about it. Don't, it it's, it's, so in this case, to me, um, ignorance is not bliss, it's subordination. Yeah. And that's what the fight is about. Yeah. The fight is about... <laughs> the fight is about challenging this, this control of our food supply. Yeah. And, you know, it's fine to just say we're going to go around them, and those of us who have the money can go to the farmer's market and join a CSA and, and find... Ulti you know, you can, avoid, you can avoid genetically modified food perfectly well by buying organic. <laughs> Right? I mean, that's one way. If you don't want to eat it, you if buy it. If you organic. can afford it. If you can afford it. And so one of, the, one of the things this fight is, is an effort to democratize the ability to buy non-GM food. Um, because it will not be more expensive, uh, as, despite what they're telling us. They're, they're saying in their ads that it would add $400 to the average California family's annual food bill. That number um, was a product of a PR company. Um, that tried to analyze what would be a number that would be high enough to scare people, but not too high to lose credibility. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. It's a main PR company that, that has no economic expertise, but they did focus groups on that topic, and then they decided, well, let's come up with some kind of calculation that will arrive at three to 400, and they did, came up with 400. And it's, it's so uh, patently obvious that they're, they're just deceptive. The, the ads are so full of lies, it's very frustrating for me. Um, well, it's enormously frustrating, and, and I don't understand, and I should because I'm a journalist, why newspapers and television stations haven't done a better job calling it out. And just I have it. a theory. Yeah. I mean, I think as I mean, I think journalists have really let the public down on this issue by by uh, not challenging these ads. Now, some. Some journalistic organs are making a lot of money taking this advertising. Um, well, that's true. And they also, the newspaper, there's 34 major newspapers in, in the state that have come out no on 37. And their, their editorials uh, explaining their, their endorsement um, strike me as word for word from the press releases from the Grocery Manufacturers Association and from the no on 37 campaign. And I've looked at this and I thought, well, newspapers are under a lot of financial stress. They've lost all their classified ad revenue to Craigslist. Um, their subscriptions are down. They're, 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 they're in tremendous financial difficulties. But their main advertisers are still the processed food companies. If you go and actually look at a hard copy of a newspaper, the ads are food ads and mostly junk food ads. And Coke, Pepsi, um, are big there. And the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which is the lobby of the processed food industry, has said, the president of it said earlier this year, that his number one priority for the year was to defeat Proposition 37 in California. So the newspapers are dependent for, the, I think they're protecting their advertisers. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I, I'm not convinced of that. Uh, it might be true, but editorial boards have a certain amount of freedom. And uh, I mean, I think that that would be really pathetic if it were true. Um, I'm just, I'm not prepared to go there. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised that, that so many editorial boards have come out against this. Um, it, it's striking. Um, but I don't know, you know, I don't know 
what happened in those conversations? People in the campaign must have gotten in to talk to editorial boards. Um, well, you know, the, it, one of the, another thing that the ads say, that no one 37 ads are saying, that um, seems to be an effective argument, and a lot of the uh, editorials from the papers seem to reflect this, is that the proposition is full of exemptions. Yeah. And uh, the reality is, yes, there are some exemptions. Um, those, the pattern of exemptions exactly duplicate what is in the European Union and in the other, other over 50 countries that mandate labeling. So we're just not trying to leapfrog ahead of them. We're trying to be consistent um, and coherent with them. Um, the, the ads say that Prop 37 is, is um, funded by special interests. I know many of the people, I'm sure you do too, who are involved. I think they're very special people. <laughs> but, but Monsanto, talk about special interests. Well, they're very special too. <laughs> I mean, it seems like this is going to affect the whole country. And I know. I think it could. I mean, I think it could. I mean, here's what I think would happen. I, I wrote a piece about this in the Times a couple weeks ago. Um, as I understand it, I mean, there's some, we should talk about what's, what you know, this administration's been doing and yes. not doing on food. Yes. Um, but um, President Obama kind of gets the food movement. He gets the idea. He said things that indicate he can really connect the dots between the way we're growing food industrially and these giant monocultures. And he credits you, by the way. He talks about your, reading your has, books. Well, he mentioned, uh, yeah, he gave a quote um, based on an article I'd written once where he talked about the links between monocultures and the health care crisis uh, and the energy crisis and the climate change crisis and how all those three things are linked by food and the way we grow food. And we can talk more about why that's so. But he gave that quote, and then he was attacked by uh, the Republican senator from Iowa, and he backed way off. He also gave a quote in Iowa saying that he supported the labeling of genetically modified food during the last campaign. Yeah. So I think his, actually his heart is in the right place on these issues, and he understands them. And, um, but he hasn't decided it was the time was ripe to invest any political capital in pushing these issues. And the reason he gives, and, and, and he said this to several people I know who's lobbied him on food issues, I've never had the chance to, um, that, uh, you know, show me the movement. How many votes do you have? You know, I, I, I don't see a movement here. And, and then finally, and this is, a, this is a quote from FDR, make me do it. Make me do it. This is our chance to make him do it. And I think, that, I think that this would really be noticed in Washington. Um, and it would, you know, what happens in California often does become the norm. I mean, we saw it on car emissions, uh, you know, fuels, fuel economy standards. Uh, Prop 2, the, uh, the Humane Society, you know, put forward that proposition a couple years ago to outlaw battery cages for, for hens uh, in egg production and sow crates for uh, pigs in pork production. And that is very rapidly becoming the norm nationally. Corporations, big agribusiness companies are negotiating now with the Humane Society to keep that off the ballot in other states. They're just kind of caving on that issue. So, you know, we can, we can make this the standard. I mean, they, they will fight it in court. I mean, don't celebrate too quickly if it passes, because, no, Monsanto will be in court the next day. Um, but, you know, it isn't really clear that they'll win. Um, so anyway, there is, a, there is a lot at stake for the whole food movement, for all the other issues you care about. Uh, and uh, so I hope you'll tell your friends. There are uh, phone banks. And if you go to the website, um, carighttoknow.org, is that it? Yeah. Uh, you, there's a phone bank place. You can click there and join the phone banks. That's a way to get active that'll help. Um, it, one, one, facet of the proposition that isn't talked about a lot is that it would, as well as requiring labeling, it would um, mandate that foods could not be called natural. The, the word natural could not be used on uh, food products containing GMOs. Right now, the word natural <laughs> doesn't actually mean very much. Uh, if, if there's no actual legal definition to it. And, I guess anything that exists on Earth is, in a sense, natural. Uh, at least the way they, they'll, they'll stretch it. Um, 
And this would start to, to get some definition to it. Right now, um, the only way you can be sure not to get GMOs is to buy organic food. Um, and which, which brings to my mind, there was a study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine a month or so ago that came out of Stanford, although it doesn't represent Stanford as a whole. It's being called, inaccurately, the Stanford Organic Study. And it, it, it seemed to, the, the way the press is talking about it, uh, it's, it seemed to find that organic food isn't worth any, any extra money, that there's no advantages to it health-wise. Um, and yet the study did find uh, much greater pesticide residues in conventionally grown food than organic. It, no surprise there. It did study also found that uh, organic meats had far less antibiotic-resistant bacteria than uh, conventionally produced meats. Um, but th th there's been this assumption, somehow the press has taken it to mean there's no advantage to organic food and it's a waste of money, and it's an elitist thing, and it's just basically a, a con job. And, and when I see that happening, I hurt, because I know that's not true. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, here's a case where I, I, I will dump on the press. Um, I think that, uh, I think the press did a really sloppy job in covering this study, uh, and overplayed it. Uh, the New York Times in particular, the paper I write for. Um, the study had all sorts of problems, um, but the, the big one is, I think, that it erected a straw man, uh, and that straw man was that the reason to buy organic is because they're, that the food is more nutritious. Not healthier, more nutritious, which is to say higher levels of, of, of nutrients, of, of minerals and antioxidants and all this kind of stuff. And it looked at all the research on that question, well, actually, not all the research on that question. They left out some very important studies for reasons that were never really explained, um, and concluded that there were differences, but by the, in the judgment of the authors of the study, they were not significant. Um, now, this is not a new study. This is what's called a meta-analysis. It looked at 250 other studies um, and crunched the data. And, you know, there was another meta-analysis done a year, just a year before, based on the same studies that had concluded that the differences were significant. Um, so there's some judgment in that. But the main point is, that is not the reason people buy organic. Um, they buy organic, well, there, there are several reasons they buy organic, but a more important one is lower levels of pesticide residues. Um, and there are, other, there are other reasons, too, that are, I think are just as important or more important, which is environmental. I mean, to keep these pesticides out of the environment, to keep... <laughs> to support farmers who are not uh, subjecting their farm workers to pesticides. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's a whole range of, of reasons, keeping the water clean and, um, and the soil healthier. And um, so it was, it was a kind of phony thing that just fix on this one thing. Now, even in this one area, there actually is some intriguing but not definitive research that a food grown in healthy organic soils does have higher nutrient levels, which is interesting. Um, but is it significant? No, most of us are getting plenty of nutrients. You know, we're not suffering from, I mean, we're over, we, you know, we're overfed in this country. We're not, there are not a lot of nutrient deficiencies. So it, I don't think that's the, the best reason. Um, so anyway, the, the, the story got hyped. I think part of the reason is that in the, in the elite media, um, the, f the critique of industrial food has gotten plenty of play. It is, the media has really been on our side for the most part. Um, and I, I, I know this from writing for the New York Times where you know, I've written on lots of other topic, topics, but when I wrote about food, I never had to give equal time to the other side, uh, you know, and I could say whatever I thought and offer my own conclusions and say you should buy grass-fed beef and organic is better, and, and um, because these editors in New York didn't realize there's anyone who disagrees with that point of view. <laughs> and so, so there was, I, I felt like I had a free ride for a long time. And then about two years ago, maybe three years ago, the industry decided they had to fight back. And, in, and, and since then, they have organized a very well-funded PR campaign 
that sometimes you've, you've seen some evidence of. There's something called the food dialogues that are being presented in various places to really talk about how food's produced and, and greater transparency. Um, uh, and I found this. I've, my, I, I've been able to get my students into like slaughterhouses and things like that that would never have happened a few years ago. And they're lobbying newspapers and editorial boards saying you've got to give equal time. And you see all these kind of anti-local board pieces and anti, you know, pro-GM pieces on the op-ed page um, everywhere. So I think they have kind of spooked the newspapers into realizing they need to give equal time on this issue. And, it's, and it is an issue with two sides. Um, so I think that that's part of And so when they have something like the Stanford study that's critical of organic, they're, they, they're happy to play it up. To, so they can then say to the Farm Bureau or whoever is talking to them, see, we are covering the, the other side. So I think yeah. that that's what's going on, and that's why the, the movement is getting a somewhat less friendly press than they were. But even the Times ended up writing a piece about the methodology of that study, which is as close to a retraction as, as they would be willing to go. <laughs> when you uh, just now referred to us at, as a society as overfed, um, I'm, I'm thinking about these rising obesity rates and kids and adults and all the, the diseases that come from that and healthcare costs. And, I, and I'm, I'm also thinking about the fact that there are in the world today about a billion people suffering from diseases caused by inadequate food. They don't have enough to eat. And so they don't have enough any of the nutrients, actually, including calories. And then we have another billion or so people, many of them in this country, suffering from illnesses of over, over yeah. consumption. Too many calories, too much fat, too much everything, basically. Too much food. And, and, and this, there's this kind of almost macabre mirror image there, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about a human tragedy of epic proportions. Mm -hmm. And it's the same food system that's producing both outcomes, uh, yeah. yes. I mean, in many ways. Um, uh, you know, which is this globalized food system based on a handful of grains, um, you know, corn and rice and soy and uh, wheat and... Um, uh, and, you know, Raj Patel wrote a wonderful book called mm -hmm. Stuffed and Starved mm -hmm. uh, about this, um, that it is all one complex. And, you know, industrial agriculture is incredibly productive and is producing uh, something like 3,000 calories for every person on the planet. And we don't need that many. Um, but it is not distributing them in a way that makes uh, nutritional sense, ecological sense, you know, sense in terms of equity. Um, so a whole lot of those calories are wasted. A whole lot of those calories are fed to cars. And, and, and then a giant percentage of those calories are fed to animals to produce meat. Um, so there's, you know, there, there are enough calories being produced to feed everybody if we, if we rationalize the system and didn't have the, the, the kind of... Um, organization of, of food that we have. On the other hand, th that, that same system is, is, is also taking these handful of crops, corn and soy in particular, yeah. and turning it into not just meat, um, but into junk food. I mean, you know, we're subsidizing the building blocks of, of, of fast food. Um, and, you know, all these, uh, all the refined oils, the sweeteners, the high fructose corn syrup, and um, uh, so, and that's, you know, we know is contributing to obesity. I mean, the way we're, we're producing food. So it's, you know, these monocultures of, of grains and commodity crops um, leave some people very hungry. And even in countries that have had great success growing lots of grain now, such as India, um, the, 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 the benefits of that grain do not extend to Indians. I mean, there are, you know, even in years of starvation in India, the, the silos were full and overflowing uh, because people didn't have the money to command the food. Um, and subsistence agriculture had been broken down so people didn't have food in the field that they could eat um, because they'd moved into these chemically intensive monocultures. So it's a, you know, it's a deeply dysfunctional system at the moment. Um, and, uh, and that's, you know, a big part of what the food movement is trying to do and, and, and researchers are trying to do. And, and, you know, there are other ways to do it. And, um, 
uh, and that, I think, is what we're, we're building or trying to build. Yeah, I, one of the things I appreciate about your work very much is the, that you see that the food on our plates is an environmental reality, it's a political reality, it's a cultural reality, it's a social reality, it's, it's, it touches all these dimensions of our lives. And, and the current as you, chemical monoculture system is, is just impairing the diversity. It, it's it's to, in some ways destroying the diversity that is the resilience of life. Mm -hmm. and, and you and I were talking about the, the uh, um, heirloom tomatoes mm -hmm. and there's so, the, the varieties of them and how delicious and unusual and interesting they, and intriguing they are. And whether we're going to see a resurgence of heirlooms and alternative varieties and in other, other areas besides tomatoes and well, we're going to need resilience. Um, you know, we're going to need as much crop diversity as possible because the climate is changing. And um, growing what we're growing, where we're growing it, in the next 20 or 30 years is, is, is not going to work anymore. So we need to, to place a lot of different bets, not one big bet on, you know, these narrow, I mean, all the corn we grow in America is based on just a couple strains. I mean, a couple, yeah, um, yeah. you know, the, the genetic diversity is so small. Um, and it's gotten smaller with genetic engineering because yeah. they just focus on those, you know, those really successful um, cultivars. Um, but we're gonna have to try a lot of different things and, and, and you know, there is, there is resilience in diversity. Um, and so the effort to keep alive that biodiversity, which is happening in farms and gardens, uh, you know, all over the world, um, and depends on people being able to save seed, uh, yes. which of course is yes. a practice that is on its way out. Um, and <laughs> got a seed saver up there. Um, this is going to be really important. There's yeah. a lot at yes. stake yeah. in uh, in preserving biodiversity, and we contribute to that, of course, with our food choices. You know, when we, were, when we only bought delicious apples, yeah. that was the only apple that was out there. And, and now we have an explosion of diversity in apples, which is a very healthy thing. Um, and we need to do the same thing in, in all our crops, because if we diversify our diets, farmers plant different things. And, and not to mention, there, um, Stanford might disagree, but there's a lot of health benefits in, uh, in diversifying your diet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what percentage of, of the corn crop right now is, is genetically engineered? 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent. And how much of that is BT corn? That's, oh, that's, All well, of it? I think it's most of it. There's some Roundup yeah. corn, too. Yeah. But BT corn is the big product. This is corn that, that puts out a, uh, a, a, a very, you know, a fairly benign uh, pesticide. It's one that's used in organic production, Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, it's a soil bacteria that produces a toxin that poisons a uh, certain class of insects. The corn borer and the cotton weevil. And, right. but, the, but it produces it in every cell of the plant. Yeah, that's the problem. It, it's, it's not targeted, so it's in the food, too. Yes. And, and the potatoes I grew were BT potatoes, uh -huh. and every spud was exuding the BT, which has not been in the human diet before. <laughs> and, and the, the weird thing was, and I looked at this when I was writing this piece, like, well, okay, you're saying that the FDA just declared in 92 uh, that, uh, organ uh, that genetically modified food was substantially equivalent to the food it was replacing, and, uh, which they did over the objections of their own scientists. Um, but how, and I, and I asked the guy, at the, uh, David Atchison, the guy at the FDA who was supervising, I said, well, there is something new here. There's, there's a new protein here, and how come this hasn't been treated as a food additive and been subject to the extensive testing that food additives get? And he says, oh, that's an easy one. It's a pesticide. I said, what do you mean? He says, yeah, the FDA, we're not allowed to regulate pesticides. That's the EPA's job. So, so to the FDA, the presence of this new pesticide in the food supply was invisible. It was legally invisible. So, so then I went to the EPA and I said, so what about this uh, pesticide and um, uh, why, you know, uh, uh, have you tested it? He says, oh yeah, it's, a, it, you know, it's much better than the other pesticides, so we're not that worried about it. I said, great. And then I looked, though, that the BT I had in my, in my garden shed, which I used because I was growing potatoes, um, had this extensive warning label of all the things that like, you should be concerned about in BT. It was the standard boilerplate stuff, and 
And so I went back to the guy at the EPA and says, how come you don't have um, a warning label on the food that, that's including the pesticide? When you buy the pesticide in the garden center, it has a warning label. He says, oh, that one's easy. We, um, only the FDA can label food. <laughs> <laughs> so they've kind of like, they've just kind of threaded the needle in terms of regulation. It's kind of brilliant. Um, yes. Brilliant in a macabre kind yeah, of way. Yeah. They, they, they also, uh, in, in labeling it uh, or considering it as substantially equivalent, that phrase, they, they decided that it was um, su sufficiently similar to not require pre-market testing, but sufficiently different it's as to patented. be patented. That's right. Yes, exactly. That's the beautiful double standard. Yes. This stuff is so new and radical that we can patent it and you can't do anything about it. You can't save your seeds and everything. Yeah, that's what they're saying on one, uh, one side of their mouth, and the other is like, same old, same old, don't worry, just eat it. And uh, yeah, they do want to have it, but let's get off GA, genetic modification. <laughs> let's talk about something else. Okay, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> Great. Let's see what they okay. want to talk about. Sure. Yeah. Oh, you do you have questions? Well, let's just take some. Yeah, let's take two to three now. Yeah. All right, I have trouble with two-part questions because I only can remember one part. Um, <laughs> I'll take the farm bill, if you're willing to lock the doors because you can lose people when you're talking about the farm bill. <laughs> well, we don't have a farm bill now. It was kind of an amazing thing. The farm bill is, is, the, is the piece of legislation that every five years sets the rules for the, for the whole food system. It has an enormous impact over uh, the kind of food that's available to us and, and its price. And, um, and they started a farm bill conversation over the summer, I think in full knowledge that it would never pass. Because in an election year, it's very hard to move a farm bill, especially with the Tea Party you know, controlling the purse strings in the House. So for some reason, though, they started pushing. And, and, um, and it's always a big fight anyway. And I, and I think the reason that they started the process was simply to shake down the lobbyists and get some money for their campaigns. I, 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 that's the only <laughs> conceivable, I know it's a little cynical, but that as soon as you start moving a farm bill, ConAgra, Monsanto, you know, Cargill, they all come forward and they write checks to make sure they get what they need in the farm bill. And, uh, and everyone knew it was gonna be an expensive campaign. So, but the farm bill has the subsidies in it. It also has food stamps in it or SNAP payments. It's got nutrition programs and commodity programs. And that fact that those two very different things are in the same piece of legislation is kind of what guarantees that it's gonna be crap, you know, year after year after year. Because, um, the people concerned about hunger and, and making sure the poor have enough to eat cannot challenge the, the big farmers and the food processors who care about the subsidies or the crop insurance. So they're in this kind of unholy alliance and they, and they hide behind each other's skirts depending on who's unpopular at the time. And if the rights, you know, wants to go after um, uh, food stamps, uh, they're defended by Cargill and the Farm Bureau, um, and, and if it's a liberal moment and there's an attack on subsidies, the hunger lobby actually will defend um, the big food company. So that's the kind of thing we're stuck with right now. Um, there's a current, subsidies though have become so demonized um, in, in the public. Um, and they, they seem so hard to justify. This is essentially paying farmers, um, you know, to the tune of 20 to 25 billion dollars a year um, to grow uh, commodity crops, corn, wheat, soy, cotton, and rice. Um, either by the bushel, 
or more often direct payments that, that you get because your land is corn land and is registered as corn land, so whatever you do with it, we're sending you a check, don't worry. Um, this became very hard to justify in an era of high deficits. So the industry, and it's important to understand that, that farmers, that, that's, that crop subsidies are more for the people who buy the agricultural commodities than it is for the farmers themselves because they want to be assured of a cheap supply of these commodities. Coca-Cola has a very strong interest in crop subsidies. It keeps down the price of corn. Um, so anyway, so they moved away from subsidies in this last farm bill that they negotiated over the summer that is not going to become law, to, some, to crop insurance, to expanding crop insurance. Uh, and they guarantee now, um, uh, and the government subsidizes this crop insurance heavily, that you will make as much profit this year within certain percent as you did last year. No matter what you do, no matter where you plant, and you want to, you know, you want to put bananas in Montana, we'll guarantee it, you know, <laughs> um, which is a really kind of perverse set of incentives that we're creating. And I think potentially will cost even more because the reason everybody wants to move to crop insurance is these are very high crop prices right now and you'll lock those in, $8 a bushel corn or whatever it is. Um, so I think a disaster was averted by not having this farm bill, but we could get a worse one. But anyway, the farm bill is, is, is an issue to pay attention to. It's very obscure, um, and I've simplified it, you know, grossly. Um, but it's where we need to drive change eventually. Can we do it now? I don't think so. We don't have enough allies on the agriculture committees. It's dominated by farm state um, legislators who are just trying to maximize these subsidies. We need to get urban legislators on this committee because we need people to understand that this is not a farm bill, it's a food bill, and that eaters need to be represented along with big farmers and, and, and food processors. <laughs> so it's, it's something to ask your congressperson, why aren't you on the Ag Committee? Um, you know, we need to get, I mean, there are Californians on the Ag Committee, and, and they generally push toward more support for actual food, specialty crops, although their, their role is not as, as sunny as you might think. Um, did you know that if you are uh, receiving subsidies for growing corn and soy and, and the other commodity crops, you're prohibited from growing tomatoes or sweet corn or vegetables? And you get fined. I know a farmer in Indiana who was a corn and soybean farmer, very conventional, and some local packer said, you know, we really want to have some local Indiana tomatoes. Will you grow 10 acres of tomatoes for me? And he, and he put in 10 acres of tomatoes. And he was fined $42,000 by the USDA because the California delegation insists that as a condition of accepting subsidies for the Midwest, that those Midwestern farmers never compete with our tomatoes. So we have, to, we have to give that one up, um, I think. I mean, I, there's an effort among, Midwestern farmers want to diversify. Some of them want to diversify, and we're preventing it. So now you can unlock the doors. <laughs> um, there's also the, uh, uh, much of the money in, in the farm bill goes to the SNAP program, which yeah. used to be called food stamps, a great, great high percentage of it. And um, that money cannot be used to buy liquor or, or uh, tobacco. But there's no restrictions on what food stuffs can be purchased. And there is a movement amongst people, some states, some considerations to restrict, can't buy soda pop, can't buy junk food, can't, can't buy it. foods that we know are, are, are causing people to, to be sick. Um, and yet, of course, the Confectioners Association and the junk food lobbies are fighting it tooth and nail. Do you think there's any chance that we'll see movement there? Well, Mayor Bloomberg in New York tried uh, on a trial basis to, no, not just his soda cup thing, but the, uh, uh, he tried to uh, do an experiment and if food stamps uh, could not be used for soda um, and do a trial and see if it had an impact on consumption of soda and obesity and diabetes, and the USDA wouldn't let him do it. Um, that's the power of the soda industry. Yeah. yeah. So I'm getting a signal. Yeah. We have time for just one more question, and you had your hand up. Thank you. 
we'll be very, very disappointed and angry and frustrated, and then we'll get up the next day and we'll do what needs to be done. You know, it's. I, I think it's important to realize. I mean, I'm not willing to to concede defeat yet on this thing, but it's important to realize that these fights take a long time. And if you go back and look at the fight to curb tobacco, um, it took 50 years. Um, so you know. We, we have to understand the food movement is very young. Um, it, it's, you know, it hasn't had its Earth Day yet. It hasn't had its burning rivers in Cleveland yet. You know, it, <laughs> it, it, and it's growing, and it's growing really quickly. Um, but um, it's up against the most powerful industry in the country. And they threw a lot at this. Um, and I think that whatever happens, they got a real scare on this one. And, um, and you know, soda, soda taxes too, they've defeated every single one so far. These are tax, you know, this is a penny per ounce of uh, sweetened beverages, money to be used. There's one in Richmond um, uh, near me that's being fought right now, and it's on the same ballot. And the soda industry, uh, brought $1.5 million into Richmond. They're paying people $20 an hour to go out and hand out deceptive uh, labels. It's the best thing that's ever happened in Richmond. Um, <laughs> no, it's, it's a jobs program for Richmond. <laughs> Which makes me think what we really should be doing is, is, is putting this stuff on the ballot in every town in California and bring all this money in. And, <laughs> and just, like the lobbyists in Washington, just shake them down. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to announce our panelists. Um, first off, Randall Graham, biodynamic vintner. <laughs> He'll be sharing his perspective on terroir and his extraordinary property in San Juan Batista, which he calls Popolochum, the Mutsen word for paradise, where he is intent on producing singular wines expressive of place. And right next to him is Dari Yanshorn. She's on another paper. Thank you. Um, and she is the executive director of Homeless Garden Project, which we were able to visit today. We had a wonderful afternoon there. Thank you again, Dari. And Jim Cochran founder of Swantonberry Farm, the first organic strawberry farm in California. Next, we have Jamie Smith, senior manager of food services and nutrition with the Santa Cruz City Schools. And Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, marine biologist, will discuss the relationship between food, chemicals, and the ocean, leveraging his deep experience as a scientist, activist, community organizer, author, and dad. Please give a Please give a big welcome to our panelists, which you've already done. Thank you all for being here, and I'll hand it over to John from okay, here. Okay, I'm, I'm, I've been asked to moderate the panel. I don't know what that means. Um, <laughs> food fight. You have to, you have to break up fights. <laughs> but I, I want to ask each of you a question at some point here, and, 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 and Jay, I want to start with you. Because you're a mar marine biologist and you speak for the oceans. And we're Santa Cruz, we're right on the coast here. And we should know what we're doing to the oceans. If anyone would, it would be us. And you and I were talking and you said, well, you can buy organic peanut butter and know that the peanuts have been grown organically. But it comes in a plastic jar. And you're buying the jar also. And the plastic often ends up in the oceans or elsewhere doing damage. It's not biodegradable. It's going to be around for eons. And, and, and you seem to have a unique perspective on what our food system is doing, not just to the fisheries, but to the, the very biosystem that the oceans are. And I want you to speak on behalf of the oceans to us. Well, th well thanks. It's um, the only other place I'd, I'd rather be tonight would be in, in a watching game two of the World Series. <laughs> but I, Giants are winning, and we are. 
but I have to say we're in, we're in a better place here at Santa Cruz High School with John and Michael. So let's give it up for that. Um, so our, the ocean is downstream from our entire economy. Every single thing we do, our energy, our food, our waste, it all ends up impacting the ocean. Our, our entire economy impacts the ocean. So if we figure out the organic equation, if we figure out the GMO equation, if we figure out the energy equation, we're still ending up with all of this packaging. And you, know, you go and you buy organic produce, and it's wrapped in plastic, and in a lot of places around the country, fortunately not here any longer, it's wrapped in a plastic bag that you, you just get. Sometimes it's double bagged. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff doesn't end up being recycling or, or repurposed or, or recovered, as they call it. It ends up going downstream eventually. And as a marine biologist, we've been documenting that around the world for the past two decades. Uh, and it's moving in the wrong direction. So recently I was in Brazil and we found 3,400 pieces of plastic inside one young green sea turtle. Oh my God. Should, there shouldn't be one piece of plastic inside any sea turtles. And this little guy didn't make it because of 3,400 3, pieces of plastic. And you could pick through them and figure out what they had been in their prior life. And all of them in a prior life had been oil. And some of them were wrapped around food. So our management of our, our packaging, alongside our management of the product that is packaged, needs to improve. And that's a whole, you know, that's a, a bookend to this conversation about food is, you know, how we move it, how we package it, and what do we, what do, we do with that packaging afterwards. Okay. You, Jim, you've done wonders with the school system. And um, actually, it's amazing to me that what you've accomplished. And I know you don't like to uh, brag, but I would like people to know, and I would like to hear you brag just a little, because <laughs> you deserve to. You know, I, I think when we, we talked before, I said, you know, you were asking about something that we thought that we had done, which was switching from buying processed food in the plastic packaging and reheating it in the plastic packaging and shipping it out in the plastic packaging to, you know, all of our students in, in Santa Cruz. And uh, in one day, we went from that to scratch cooking in all our schools, and it was slow. <laughs> But in one way, it was the only thing I knew how to do. You know, I'm, I'm a naturally, I'm a professionally trained chef. Um, and, uh, you know, that was, that was what all my lunch ladies used to do. I, I inherited 30 lunch ladies with a cumulative 490 years of, exp of uh, service to this district. <laughs> Many of them work for someone who's sitting in the second row there, Thelma Dahlman, who uh, is the original. <laughs> The original school food hero, um, the one who campaigned uh, almost 40 years ago for the inclusion of tofu as a recognizable ingredient to the USDA. It became a recognizable ingredient on July 1st of this year. So <laughs> tofu was illegal until this year. So, you know, to a degree it feels like we have made a ton of progress, but again, we're going kind of back to the future. It was things that I was trained how to do, things that my lunch ladies were trained how to do. Um, and after we went to scratch cooking, I think what I said to you, John, was that, you know, we're done with that. You know, I'm done bragging about going to scratch cooking, what's next? And, uh, you know, we tried to expand our reach and we really see, um, at least in Santa Cruz, we see the school as one of the, you know, and we were up at the farm today and, and the farm, uh, we had a bunch of youth there from Food What and, and the farmers themselves were talking about the farm as a very safe place. We see the schools and the school district itself as a safe place for our community. And we think that one of the things that really ties them in is the food. Sure, yeah, we went to scratch cooking, but we really want to see our, our schools as a center of community service to, the, to, to our communities, whether it's you know, being a partner with Second Harvest Food Bank and being a distribution site for, for food, um, and also training our, our staff to be nutrition educators on site 
at everywhere we are. You know, it isn't just scratch cooking. It isn't just going back to our roots. It's actually spreading those roots further and further into our community. And that's the thing that we're the most proud of. And that's the thing that's really been the hardest work. You know, we, we just turned on the pots and boiled some water and we put some pasta in it. You know, we, we steamed up some rice and we bought some local fruits and vegetables. It was all easy. You know, I, I knew all the farmers that we were buying from and that, that part's been easy. Um, but now we're, we're on to the next phase. You know, we're, we're serving dinner at some of our schools. We're uh, doing nutrition education classes at night for families. Um, we're training kids. <laughs> Thanks. I, I was going to say we're, just, we're training kids. We're not. We're seeing kids engage in the food system at school and then take it home to their families, teaching their parents how to cook it, uh, again, um, much the way we are doing back when Thelma was here. You know, all my ladies are saying, you know, we used to do this. Now we have elementary school kids going home and telling their, their families and their moms and dads, hey, I, I learned how to do this at school. You know, we want to we wanna bring it home. And we, th we see that as our next and our biggest success for sure. How many of you have ever bought berries from Swanton Berry Farm? <laughs> wow. And, and uh, you know, one of the things about Swanton Berry Farm that's unique, even among organic berry growers, is the, the respect for, for the workers and the labor and, and the, the union and the conditions. And, and that's, that's very dear to me. I, I spent years growing food for my family, and it's hard work. And, and it's difficult. And, and uh, your respect for the people who, who work for you and work for all of us uh, is, is unparalleled. And I, I, I want to appreciate you for it. Well, actually, I'll dispute that. OK. <laughs> I think that there are um, other examples of, or many other examples of farms that um, do a good job with their labor practices. But what we like to do is we like to talk about it because we feel like it's an important part of the conversation um, generally about food. Um, and um, so we're not saying that we do the best job with, um, you know, very, any, pick any, uh, you know, maybe our health plan, somebody else has a better health plan or better, better dental plan or better um, training programs than we do. Um, and that's really good news. The, the point is, though, that um, we feel that the um, working conditions of the people that actually produce the food and, for that matter, um, process the food and, and deliver it and work in the retail stores, um, that that is a, an integral part of the conversation. And that um, so our goal is to... Um, include um, labor issues in the discussions about food um, rather than to say that we do the best job. In fact, we hope that we don't do the best job. Mm -hmm. We hope that there are others who are doing a better job. But yeah. um, the point is that um, we should be talking about it. And in fact, um, perhaps there should even be some sort of labeling um, regarding um, labor standards. Um, we've, we've taken the approach of um, um, having a contract with the United Farm Workers, and that's, that's a label. And um, it represents a certain set of standards that we believe in. And, um, but that's not for everyone. Maybe there's another label. In fact, there is a, some sort of several movements afoot um, interestingly, there's very little activity in this regard here in the United States, um, where most of the activity is is internationally. Um, people seem to be really concerned about the conditions of workers on banana plantations in Ecuador, but not really particularly interested in the working conditions of people on strawberry farms or tomato farms or lettuce farms. In the, here in the United States. So our, our job is to, 
talk about that and, and um, hope that other people um, take some interest. And we, we feel that the interest in that topic has been growing over the last five or six years noticeably. And so we're very pleased about that. Yeah. Gary, we, um, here in Santa Cruz, we all owe you uh, uh, appreciation and, and feel it for the Homeless Garden Project that you've been stewarding for a long time. And it was, I think, the first CSA, uh, at least the first one I knew of in the area. My understanding is we are the first CSA in the county. Homeless Garden Project was the first CSA. Yeah. And I have to say that um, there is an amazing team, and a lot of them are here tonight, and I hope they can stand up in the back there. We have an amazing team of people that make a homeless garden project happen. I, you know, I want you all to know that tonight is in part a benefit for the Homeless Garden Project, and that Michael and the rest of us have not charged anything. And, and I've been happy to be here on support of. And I want to say a couple things um, about our CSA. We do have um, one really special CSA program. It's called Feed Two Birds with One Worm. And in that program, a donor who, um, with a single donation, can not only support our training program, but they can also help to get organic produce to low-income people. And we work specifically with a few agencies um, who come and pick up their share every week. And we'd really like to expand on what we're doing with that. Um, we, um, I, I get a lot of emails from the Human Care Alliance, and one of the emails was about how all of the agencies that receive county funding um, that we're all being asked to promote CalFresh and the food stamps and make sure that all the people we work with are educated about Cal stamp, Cal, CalFresh. And um, one of the doctors at a nonprofit emailed back and said, you know, that he is keeping track of the patients that he sees. And um, he asked them two simple questions. One is, do you find yourself sometime during the month not having enough food? And the other one is, do you get food stamps? And he said that um, when he finds somebody that doesn't have enough food during the month, that he tries to remember to write down the diagnostic code that is for food deprivation. Um, and he said, you'd be surprised how many people in our county that he's seeing at this clinic um, don't get enough food, and he said it's seniors, it's single moms with children, and um, people who are couch surfing because of the bad economy. And th I'm just really moved by that and would love to find some ways to be partnering to be providing more of our produce. Another thing I'd like to say is um, the way that we deal with food at Homeless Garden Project is very simple and very direct. Um, you know, we harvest a harvest our vegetables and sell them mostly through CSA. We also have um, an opportunity where anybody from the community can come out to our farm stand. It's open 10 to 4, seven days a week. And you can harvest your own produce from whatever is available on our menu. And um, really a beautiful way of connecting with the farm, connecting with our project, and connecting with the food that you're going to take home to your family and also supporting our project while you're doing it. Um, and then we also harvest the food and cook it into a lunch that we serve to our trainees every day and also to the volunteers that are out at the farm every day. And then I just want to say two more things. <laughs> um, and everyone knows I always say two more things. Um, one is that um, you know people might not think about Homeless Garden Project um, so much as being about the food movement. But um, we have been anticipating Michael's visit and talking a lot about, you know, what's the connection between addressing homelessness and being part of the food movement. 
and Mike, who is here tonight, said the most amazing, profound thing. He said, um, you know, people are homeless for a lot of different reasons. And whatever the reason, it's a really alienating experience. But when you come here um, and work with the Homeless Garden Project and do this organic farming that we do, you know, you really start to realize that you're part of this very powerful thing, meaning the food movement. And the um, last thing I want to say is that we had a great time with Michael out at the farm today. And I'm really grateful to Michael for um, the attention that he gave to our program. And um, each of our trainees talked a little bit about you know, what they do at the farm and what the farm means to them and how the training program works. And uh, at the end, one of the trainees gave a particularly long, she talked for longer than the rest of us about um, her experience with falling into homelessness and how the farm has been a place for her to, to heal and to start becoming more her authentic self and to feel that there is some hope and a path out of homelessness for her. Okay, thank you. Hey, Michael, I just wanted to uh, yeah. add on um, just how many of you have been to the, to the garden? A lot of you. So you know, you know, it's, it's a very special place. It's a very inspiring place. And I met some extraordinary people today. <laughs> Um, and uh, you, you witness the, the power of growing food, um, what it can do for people uh, in terms of um, uh, a sense of accomplishment, a sense of, uh, you know, food, food creates community too. And, and there's clearly a, a, a very vibrant community there and amazing stories. And uh, you're very lucky to have this organization and this place. I mean, the karma of that, that that little farm is just spectacular. So hats off to you for your great work. Randall, when we spoke about your adventures in winemaking, and in, um, I, I was struck that your, your philosophy uh, is so different than, than the prevailing one that I've come to associate to the wine industry. And uh, you seem to care deeply about the quality of the wine and the experience and the health of the people who drink it. And um, given the, the problems that alcoholism uh, represent in our society, that, you, that you, you're producing wines that actually, the goal is that the person feels good while they're drinking it, and afterwards, and the day after as well. <laughs> that, that's striking to me. It, 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 would, you, would you say something about the underlying philosophy that you sure. bring to it? Sure, perhaps it's a little ambitious to um, expect people to feel like a million bucks the next day, but <laughs> it's, an aspira it's aspirational, at least. The idea is really very simple, in a sense. We have, we have a word, wine, which is used interchangeably to mean a lot of different things, from an industrial product to an artisanal product to something that has been farmed uh, very mechanically and uh, chemically, if you will, to something that's, that's a more natural. And it's really, in a sense, a con almost a continuum, uh, not really a dichotomy. But they're very, very different. And um, the French make an interesting distinction between what they call wines of effort and wines of terroir. So wines of effort, and again, this is kind of a continuum, but a wine of effort is one where the winemaker or the wine grower has determined every single aspect in the, in the production, from the clone that's grown, to how it's grown, to uh, using drip irrigation, to using cultured yeasts and enzymes and additives that control the outcome very, very specifically. And you get a very reliable product, but at, at the end of the day, it's kind of a banal product. 
On the other end, you have wines that somehow capture a sense of place. In other words, in the wine itself is a reflection of the place where, it, where the grapes have been grown, whether it's the soil type, the exposure, there's some quality of the, of the place that's reflected in the wine. And this, you need a lot of skill to be able to capture this and reflect it. And what I would argue is that when you experience wines like that, it's a deeper emotion, you have a deeper emotional connection. This is maybe poetic or maybe unduly poetic, but in other words, you begin to recognize that you are made out of the same molecules, the same dirt, the same minerals. It's, a, it's, a, it's an identification. Now maybe, you know, we urban folks or maybe are, are a little divorced from our uh, from agricultural experience, but this is a way in some fashion to participate in this, in this more natural process. So those are the wines that are interesting to me. Interestingly enough, these are old fangled wines. These are low tech wines. These are the opposite of the way wines are being made these days. It's almost like state of the art 1870, 1880. <laughs> and what's interesting is that the world is kind of taking us in that direction anyways, whether we like it or not. When resources reach their real, are valued the way they, they should be valued, when water has, takes on its real cost, when fertilizer takes on its real cost, we'll begin to understand that low-tech, low low-input farming is really the only thing that makes any sense, and it makes the most interesting <laughs> wine. So, you know, it's, it's funny, I travel a lot on the 101 corridor. Uh, I, since I grew up in Los Angeles and been driving up to Santa Cruz since I was a kid, um, it used to be just farmland or meadows or pasture, and now it's essentially wall-to-wall -wall vineyards. And I have to say, I get no thrill out of seeing miles and miles of wire and end posts and drip irrigation. I would love to see, for me personally, much more aesthetic would be an organic farm, uh, organic form. In other words, head trained vine, something that took on an, a, a more natural, uh, natural shape without the wires, without the end posts, without the irrigation, something that was, was living uh, in, in greater harmony with the, with the site itself, a lower, lower input. So that, a sculptural form, in other words. And those are, that's the kind of uh, old-fangled vineyard that I aspire to produce. Thank you. We have time for some questions. And um, I'll, call, is, I'll call on people, if that's all right, with the organizers. And, um, you can address your question to a specific person or just, or just to us. Um, and who would like? I mean, probably sure a lot of hands, but yes, sir. I mean, as a political matter, I don't, think it's, it's, I don't think it's the right ground to fight this fight on. And I think that, in fact, the campaign, uh, if I were directing the campaign, would not be talking about health. Um, because it's a hard conversation to win right now. Um, the, the, uh, during the midst of this campaign, um, a, a study came out of France by a man named Seralini. Uh, who had given a roundup, a roundup corn, is it corn or soy? Corn? Um, to, um, to rats and did a long-term feeding study and some very alarming things happened to those rats. 
Um, they develop tumors at, at pretty high rates and some other problems. Um, and this study was announced only about a month ago. Um, and, but there were, and it was challenged, strongly challenged, by um, uh, a, a group of scientists, uh, some of whom may or may not have been you know, affiliated with Monsanto in some ways. Um, but from what I've been able to learn, and, and in some ways, the, the attack on this study was unfair. Um, because Seralini was essentially, they attacked him on methodology, the number of rats in the study and the feeding protocols and all this kind of stuff. But in fact, he was following the exact same protocols that Monsanto did when they proved that this stuff was safe, which they had to do in Europe, not here. Uh, same kind of rats, same kind of feeding, but longer term. Um, that said, both studies, from, what, from the biologists I've talked to, are simply not adequate. Uh, they're, they're not strong studies. They don't have enough animals um, to, uh, to draw the kind of conclusions. Um, and uh, so, you know, do you want to get in that discussion when the right to know is, 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 is enough? Um, I think the answer to that study, even if it was a bad study, was, hey, this is kind of alarming. We should study this more. And we should fund those studies. And we should require Monsanto to, to fund those studies. Um, and that was my reaction to it, not bad study, end of story. And that's kind of how it's been dealt with in the media. Um, so all I'm suggesting is that, yeah, there, 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 there is enough out there to make you think we should be looking at this more closely than we have. It's definitely not exonerated. Um, but as a journalist, as a political activist, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want this movement to, to depend on that. Um, and there is a lot of alarmism in the anti-GM camp. Um, there, you know, it's sort of like cell phones. People blame all sorts of things on GM, and I don't think that helps. Um, uh, so I think we have to be very careful about the science we use and the science we cite, and, um, and hold ourselves to uh, a high standard and demand more science. Now, Monsanto prohibits you from doing science. And the reason that these studies come out of Europe is because in America, when you buy Monsanto seeds, you have to sign a contract saying you won't conduct academic research on it, whether you're a soil scientist, yeah, or a medical scientist. So they really tightly control what we know about this. And, and people don't know that. Um, so, you know, uh, that, and that, you know, you know, the answer to bad science, as, as they used to say, the answer to bad speech is more speech. The answer to bad science is more science, and we need a lot more science. So, um, it's a parallel, parallel issue. Uh, the first definitive study of microplastic pollution in the journal Science, which is one of the best in the land, was in 1972, ringing the alarm bell about the hazard of microplastic, which tends to glom on to all sorts of bad things, PCBs, DDT, et cetera, when it's floating in the ocean, then it gets passed up the food chain to us. 1972, a little while ago, definitive study in the journal Science, ringing the alarm, you can read it. First author's name is Carpenter. Just go on Google Scholar, you'll find it. You can read it, warning, publication with solid science. 40 years later, where are we? The problem's way worse. Exponentially growing. The industry is saying, we need more science. Turtles don't eat plastic, et cetera. You can look at the save the bag, save the plastic bag .com is actually a real website. <laughs> uh, probably more better funded than the <laughs> Stop the Plastic Bag website. <laughs> but this is, this is, you know, we go around this, this gerbil wheel uh, on all of these issues over and over. It's, um, it's deny, then delay, and distract. And that's where we go. <laughs> You know, I just want to say, folks, that, you know, that there's one scientist up on the stage. You know, Michael's a journalist. Jay's a scientist. 
I'm a chef, <laughs> farmer, farmer, advocate, and vintner. Um, and we all know what we know, but when we say that we do want to focus on the science of Prop 37 and GMOs, um, I agree with Michael, that is not a win situation. Um, we're just, you know, the folks up here are telling you what we know, but the reality is you people in the room have, uh, you know, the same amount of power and the same amount of knowledge as we do in reality. Um, this is a bellwether of whether or not you folks and everyone in California has a say in big government and big ag. It has nothing to do with the science right now. The science will come. Um, but when you go to the, the polls to vote, it's about your right as, as a citizen to know what's being fed to you, um, whether in this political BS that we get or in the food that you're going to consume. And, and it's simply about that, that one thing that is going to be the most powerful weapon we have against all this money, this million dollars a day that they're pumping against us. So focus on that. Um, that's the popular approach, or the people's approach. Um, and I want to say something about the legal approach. Really, at the base of a lot of the problems in the world is the um, fact that we are not adhering to antitrust law. And um, you, could, you could see um, a lot of things that happen in the world um, you know, you pretty much, there's six carrot companies, there's six wine companies, there's six retail store, retail chains, there's six, six of everything pretty much in the world. Uh, maybe there's 12, you know, 12 oil companies, 12 this and that, you know. And really what we're dealing with is an antitrust issue that the people um, have not recognized yet. But um, there's six banks, you know, 12, okay, 12 banks. <laughs> oh, three carat companies, okay. But, you know, there's pretty much a dozen of, let's say a dozen of everything in the world that pretty much dominates 50, 60, 70, 80% of whatever it is, media companies. Yeah. And um, as Michael was saying, you know, we haven't really found our voice as a movement yet, but I think we need to be thinking um, about grounding our movement in um, in some basis of the laws that uh, were formed maybe in the 1890s and so forth. And, you know, 100 years ago, there were big battles fought over uh, why it is that there are only a handful of people in each category of human activity that control things. You know, there was a, check out The Economist this week or last week. To my shock, this is a pretty, you know, right free market publication. They called for breaking up the big monopolies worldwide. <laughs> Stunning. <laughs> and the reason was they were, they're getting, the, the, they're getting alarmed. They're beginning to get alarmed about inequality as a drag on growth worldwide. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and they don't think tax redistribution is the best way, but they do think that this is the result of too much power and too much economic power concentrated in too few hands, and that we should take another serious look at antitrust. It's kind of a, a shocking um, editorial, but I think you're absolutely right. And um, you know, this is, a, this is a tremendous failing of this administration. Um, there was a, a, a law passed in the last farm bill to really challenge the four big meat packers. There are only four companies when you're talking about meat. And they, and they uh, pack 85% of the, of the beef uh, in this country. And um, they really victimize ranchers. Uh, they decide who they're going to buy from. And if you make trouble, I met a rancher uh, two weeks ago who came to my class who was uh, challenging the big four. And, uh, and one day, nobody bought his meat anymore. Um, they just cut him out. They got together and said, well, we're going to kill this guy. And, um, and so uh, something was passed in the farm bill to make that kind of practice uh, illegal. And the Obama administration held um, uh, hearings all over the country, Department of Justice, USDA, uh, the GIPSA laws. And they're, they're laws. And they haven't done anything. Um, so, 
the reason that you get into this situation where with big money you can defeat the popular will is because you have monopoly. That's where that money comes from. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and, and so I couldn't agree more with Jim that that's what we need to pay attention to. And the reason that nothing is happening goes back to a decision made in the Reagan administration, which was that combinations of uh, companies were OK if it didn't harm the consumer. So in other words, as long as prices were low, and beef prices are low, meat prices are low, there's no grounds for action. Now, that's not why we have antitrust laws. They go back to the beginning of the country. In fact, Jefferson wanted a 12th Amendment to the Constitution that would have banned monopoly. <laughs> um, they understood how important it was because, the, you know, at the, in those days, there was a monopoly, the East India Company, and that, that was a huge problem in the world. Um, but anyways, um, no, the, the reason we're, we have laws against monopoly is for concentrations of political power that are a threat to the government, that are a threat to all of us, and that's what we find. Um, and now we've given these monopolies uh, personhood and, and, and free speech rights. And now that's, you know, t to allow monopoly and then give free speech to monopoly, it's a very dangerous combination. Uh, I was asked to be sure that we, we completed um, by 9 o'clock, which we are uh, a little, just a tiny bit past. So um, I want to thank you all for being here, for your attention and your presence and your uh, being. And, and your good questions. And your good questions. I want to thank the panel for your... and make waves. Before, before you go forth, um, before you go forth, we do have the raffle. And also, if you would just take a moment, um, I wanted to give a special thanks to John Robbins for moderating our event tonight. And also another very, very special thanks to the producers of this event, Dana Nichols with Slow Coast and Elizabeth Borelli with Sustainable Santa Cruz. Yeah. And to Maya Zohara for emceeing. Thank you.